the uh, now co-director of the Farley Center. Farley Center is focused on educating undergrads and grads in the overall topic of entrepreneurship and innovation. We have a series of courses we run that blend not just engineering content, but also non-engineering content from the business school, from Medill, from various parts of the university, including the law school, including the medical school. We bring these people together to do cross-functional uh, innovation and product and business design. What I wanted to start with, I guess, just kind of quickly, this, this, this one slide is a slide that shows the Fisker Karma car, which, as you know, Fisker has since, you know, had significant troubles financially. At the same time, they were competing with Tesla. Tesla had tremendous success with their Model S. The Fisker Karma failed miserably, and yet you could argue, even though they looked similar on the surface, you double click on both of them, they had completely different business models, completely different approaches to design, different approaches to solving the technical problems. This was more of a, a hybrid, uh, which was reusing existing designs from Europe. Um, the, mess, the Model S from Tesla was redesigned, actually designed from the ground up to be an electric car with an aluminum chassis and aluminum body. They actually hired Audi engineers, the last people to build a fully aluminum vehicle, the Audi A8. Those people were hired by Tesla consciously and, and, and specifically to design the car for Tesla. So while Tesla and Fisker were neck and neck at some point, right, there's no longer even a horse race. It seems like Tesla is running away with it, and Fisker's kind of uh, falling to the sidelines here. I wanted to start with a video as to what is the McCormick School. Some of you may not be fully aware of who we are and what we stand for. And it's kind of a whole brain engineering approach. It's, this video is called The Great Intersection.
you get a sense of this whole brain engineering that McCormick espouses, and you can maybe rationalize why the Entrepreneurship Center actually resides inside of the engineering school instead of what other schools tend to do. Universities tend to put them inside the business school. So why isn't this in Kellogg? Because we are multidisciplinary, and we believe, at least the, the engineering school believes, that innovation comes uh, from often technology and breakthrough uh, you know, changes and breakthrough innovations that enable the startups to succeed. We were voted the number one school in the Midwest by Forbes as one of the most entrepreneurial colleges in the Midwest. This new Vention series of courses that we run have various verticals, but they are multidisciplinary. They're grad in nature, grad, grad student focused. We have medical, we have web, we have energy. I run the clean tech energy course for new Vention. We have one on impact, which is focused on social impact. We have one on nano, right? So we have all these various verticals, which is kind of unique for a university. And what's even more unique is for a Midwest school to actually go to the Rice Business Plan competition and basically win it three years running. So we wanted a Synode. Synode was an innovation in the lithium ion battery space, right? So the use of graphene technology inside the anode portion of the lithium ion battery to extend its uh, charging capacity and how quickly it can charge. So actually these battery innovations are now being picked up by companies like Motorola, right, that are actually very interested in partnering with uh, Sino. Numat is actually a technology that's focused around the storage of compressed natural gas and the ability to store it in a more, I guess, dense fashion. And then um, Bright Seed, which was a medical innovation. We've had a lot of young startups and, and you know, alumni from our programs. Mert Isiri, second from the right, this guy here, was actually a student of mine in my undergrad course. He invented a product that dispenses um, sanitizing solution inside a clinical setting in a hospital. And you can say, well, what's so special about that? Well, it clips on your belt, and it's got a Wi-Fi chip. So now you can hold the clinicians accountable for the prevention of disease spread in the clinical setting, right? So you can actually count and track. So this was more targeting at, targeted at the managers of the hospital who were worried about hospital-borne infection, which is a huge problem in the US, right? So the key th things I want to talk about today, innovation is vital for long-term differentiation. Um, crowdsourcing and, and ecosystems are a big part of how to differentiate yourselves. Innovative business models can enable technology or new, te new technology adoption. Um, and what that means is it's not so much the product itself, but how it is modeled in front of the users and customers and how they can perceive and extract value from the product. Products fail for multiple reasons. I mean, one reason is failure to execute. The product quality isn't there, the features aren't there, the product is late to market. More often than not, the products themselves don't find a market or the market doesn't find the product. And that tends to be more on the business side. So I'm going to make these distinctions between kind of business model issues and product execution issues. Lean is an approach that's taking kind of the country by storm, lean startup methodology, LSM. And what that basically amounts to is an iterative approach to designing business models with your target market, interacting with them in a low cost, high velocity way so that you're quickly iterating through low cost prototypes that allow you to progress your business model much faster than the old days. In the old days, what did we do, right? We had an idea. We wrote a business plan. Write your business plan, 40, 50 pages in detail, right? What's your in income statement, cash flow? What's your uh, balance sheet going to look like? How much cash do you need up front? Um, what's your ROI? You know, calculate what's your market penetration? How big is your market? How fast is it growing? What's your uh, share of that market? Before you've even tested the business model, you're making all these elaborate plans. The idea today is, test your business model first. You're laughing, am I right? So now we try to reverse it and we say, let's test the business model first. And then once you have a business model that you know works through interacting with your target market, then you can plan it out. But even then, we don't emphasize the 40-page business plan anymore. And in parts of the country, the 40-page business plan is being supplanted by something called the business model canvas, which is basically a one-pager that shows in different segments your target market, your value proposition, your key resources, your partners, your revenues, your expenses. And it gives kind of a logical flow so that 
your value prop should line up with your target market, and then your expenses and revenues kind of line up based on that. So that's where things are going. Um, S curves and canvases, hopefully we'll have time to get to it, probably not. The traditional view, what I grew up with, and frankly I spent 25 years working actually in this building, uh, Motorola infrastructure. So I did mostly 911 systems, later the IDEN network, which would, you would know as Nextel, right? So the Nextel system was actually architected and designed in this building and the one next to it, right? So um, very successful, very um, profitable business. In fact, in many ways, the Nextel business kind of funded some of the cellular endeavors, the early days of cellular. Product management versus project management. The product side on the left-hand side is more focused on business viability, ROI, market research, market sizing, placement, positioning, and pricing, kind of the classic marketing role. On the right-hand side, it was about execution, which is what I was always doing. I was always in charge of project management, getting the job done, getting it out the door, making sure you're on time, on budget, that the features were there, and that it worked as designed, right? The problem is you need both. <laughs> You know, one side or the other isn't going to guarantee success, right? So the burning platform is in 1995, uh, Sandage Group basically documented that 16% of the software projects actually finished on time and on budget. So by my definition, you know, 84% of the projects were failures of some form or another, different degrees of failure, right? $81 billion spent on canceled projects, $59 billion on completed ones. Right? which is a startling statistic. We're spending more money, at least in 95, right, on stuff that went nowhere compared to the projects that actually went to market. Denver Airport alone cost the city of Denver a million dollars a day. It was late by several months, mostly for software issues, mostly for baggage handling. So their whole concept was kind of centralized, high speed, you know, real time reading of those barcodes on the, on the tags. Didn't really work out that way. The software couldn't keep up with the hardware. It became kind of an integration nightmare. In 2009, 14 years after the 95 study, right, Sandish Group measures now 32% success. So despite the fact that the Project Management Institute has certified hundreds of thousands of project management professionals, and I'm one of them, right? We've got hundreds of thousands of us, right? We've all studied, we've all taken the exam, we've all supposedly demonstrated competencies. Less than a third of the projects are successful. It's pretty startling, right? And that's a huge improvement from 1995. That's a double, right? If I reflect on some of the projects I've seen in my lifetime, you know, make the distinction between project success and business success, right? The Orion project, this is Kodak's new Advantix photographic system. Kodak filed the patents for digital photography. They laid the seeds of their own destruction, right? in the 80s with that patent. Because frankly, by filing bankruptcy in 2012, I think they've admitted they didn't know how to monetize it. They knew how to invent it. They understood the technology at a kind of cerebral level. But they didn't know how to sustainably build a business or market around it. Their attitude was that they were there to sell film and paper. <laughs> so what was digital? Uh, yeah. Was digital some sort of annoyance, some sort of uh, distraction? They just they proceeded to, uh, to try to ignore it. They treated it kind of like a distraction that says, well, we'll dabble with it for a year or two. But coming out with a digital camera and putting it on the market without the ecosystem around it, such as apps, such as uh, printers, right, that are compatible with it, such as uh, support networks and infrastructure, so that Walgreens could take uh, a smart chip, a, a memory device, you can plug it in and print out your digital photographs. They didn't think it all the way through, right? In parallel, Apple Computer launched their product based on the same technology, almost at the same time that, that Kodak did. Apple's failed, so did Kodak's. Apple learned from the failure and eventually created a paradigm that says, you know what, that, this thing called digital photography is maybe just an app, right, within a larger ecosystem context, right? So they were willing to go there. Kodak wasn't willing to go there, right? Kodak's more or less history at this point. Iridium, kind of ironic that I talk about Iridium in the building that helped birth Iridium, okay? But if you guys remember this, 66 satellites in geosynchronous orbit, in essence, a celestial cellular system that you could actually uh, <coughs> interact and make phone calls anywhere on the planet. That was the value problem. Call anyone from anywhere at any time, right? 
Great idea, except for a few minor details, like buried in the business model was an assumption that you could sell airtime at $5 a minute, okay? And that people actually want to make phone calls on the top of Mount Everest or in the middle of the Sahara Desert. They also didn't plan on how fast the terrestrial networks expanded. I was going to get there. Yeah. yeah that was, so that Motorola's was, success. That was, the, that was the biggie. Motorola's success became Iridium's failure. So Motorola didn't own Iridium. It was a consortium. So Motorola might have had a significant interest in it, but they had a bigger interest in building out the cellular infrastructures in Buenos Aires and um, you know Caracas and you know parts of the world that you know historically didn't have these things. As those got built out, the need for Iridium subsided to the point where literally we were applauding ourselves in this very building, right? On the success of Iridium, having launched the satellites on time and on budget, they all worked within technical specs. I say within technical specs, but you, you and I know what that means, right? Mm -hmm. We couldn't make an Iridium phone call from this room because we don't have line of sight to a satellite here, right? Now, a few hundred feet away, we could walk into the parking lot in the freezing rain, <laughs> right? But that's not what people wanted to do. Right? What's interesting is that after it went through bankruptcy, that enough of the debt was discharged, the eventual business became profitable mm -hmm. because there were still customers. You had the military, you had emergency responders that in right. the case of a hurricane, they needed the communications. So once all that cost burden was discharged, it actually became profitable. Right. The pro other problem with the original Iridium system is it was never really set up to handle anything beyond a voice call. Right. There was, was no data no, partition. There was no expansion built into the original design. So data partitioning, encryption, right? So those yeah. very markets that you mentioned would well, be... Well, that was, that was done by an add-on piece on the back of the phone, if I remember. Right. So they're encrypting at each end instead of mm -hmm. the network itself. So. Those were because once you launch these satellites, what's, what's up there is what's up there. You're not going to do a physical yeah. retrofit. You could maybe swap out some software, right? But even yeah, but, but, the, but the, the basic infrastructure was limited to X bandwidth. Right. And it, there, there was never, when it was conceived, the thought of what we started to do with texting and everything else, which came along with the TDMA, CDMA and GSMs, extensions to those basic protocols, it just wasn't even a thought. And when I tell my students today, because they don't know what Iridium is, so I have to describe it to them, it's almost like I'm talking about history for them before they were, before they were born, right? But Iridium so still exists. It's still out there, but I mean, the original phones were literally the size of a large shoebox, right, with a baseball bat hanging off the mm -hmm. end, and otherwise known as an antenna, right? So these were pretty, you know, monstrous beasts here that didn't have very long talk times. Even the second generation was pretty large. Yeah, and it wasn't an elegant solution, but I mean, if you needed it in those rare places on Earth, I mean, this was about it. There wasn't that much competition. So despite the fact that technologically it worked exactly as planned, the project managers running it got promoted. Their methodologies got spread all over the company. At the same time that was happening, LLC, Iridium LLC was declaring bankruptcy. And the second thing that was on it is it had a competitor with MRSAT with the uh, small briefcase and then later laptop phones. Right. So they're kind of ahead of those guys, right, in terms of... Yeah, but the MRSAT was more successful because the satellites were already there and you were right. taking advantage of an existing infrastructure instead of building a whole new infrastructure. Right. So this morning we heard from the keynote that, you know, make no small plans. Iridium was by, by far no small plan. It was a huge plan. It was an aggressive plan. It was a risky plan. We didn't understand that it was more of a business risk. I think we appreciated it as a technical and maybe logistical and project management risk. We didn't really understand that you know, monetizing this thing and taking it to market was going to be the bigger issue, not so much constructing functional satellites in some factory in China. Right? HP Touchpad. I, I bring this up to students and they don't even, they don't know what, this, what I'm talking about either, right? It's just like, well, this is in your recent memory. This is August 2011. This was a 10-inch tablet competing with the iPad. Um, unfortunately, shucks, they forgot to build out the ecosystem, right? So there was virtually no apps available. It was a custom OS, if you will, that had its own protocol. So neither Android nor iOS. This was something else, the third, you know, wannabe. The problem is they were a little late to the game and not having an ecosystem, this thing was almost stillborn. Uh, it was 
within six weeks of its launch, uh, being discounted from $499 to $99, right? Fire sale. The issue there, of course, is that, well, beautiful piece of hardware, beautiful piece of software being sold below its cost, right? HP virtually went out of the business until they realized, well, let's just redeploy it as an Android device, right? So Android hacks and Android uh, OSs were being retrofitted into this very quickly. Solar City didn't invent solar panels. Solar panels have been around for a lot longer than Solar City. This is one of Elon Musk's businesses. And his innovation had little to do with the panel and everything to do with how that panel was marketed and brought to market and bundled and, and implemented as far as the consumer was concerned. So um, literally turnkey systems installed at virtually no cost up front to you, the buyer, right? It's subsidized by your savings and your electric bill. So fundamentally, you're not out any upfront cash, which was the big block to getting this thing deployed. The best pivot, and that's one of our favorite words in Lean Startup, is pivot. That and our MVP, right, minimum viable product, so our two favorite buzzwords. I think the most famous pivot ever was Apple Lisa to Apple Mac. And again, my students don't know what the Lisa is, so they have to you know, Google it. Uh, the Lisa was the precursor to the Mac. It was a business-targeted $10,000 machine with very limited functionality, but obviously a pretty good-sized footprint, as you can see in the upper left. It was GUI-based. It was a graphical user interface, right? The difference between the machine on the left and the machine on the right, besides $7,000 in selling price, uh, was the fact that it was targeting a whole different market. Now they're going after the consumer. You see on the left, they're duking it out with IBM, right? <laughs> And they didn't want to take on IBM right out of the chute, so to speak, with the only product they've had since Apple II, which was considered kind of a hobbyist machine. How could they take on IBM with a machine that's $10,000 that does a little more than word processing, when IBM is so entrenched in the corporate culture? So instead, they went around IBM. And now they've got a whole line of products under the Macintosh that is now, what I would say, instantiated in their business, so much so that it's a division. They have Macintosh products, lines, plural, across the board. Um, the real irony is that today's iPad is now being worked on by IBM, I guess, is, is becoming another corporate tool. So IBM is working with Apple to take the iPad inside the corporate firewall, right? So it's a whole new world, right? But, I mean, to me, this was the most successful pivot I could find. Ampi is something that's coming out of <laughs> Northwestern uh, New Mention Energy. It's actually a very simple device that charges, takes kinetic energy that comes from your walking down the street and turns it into electrical energy that you can store in batteries on the empty device, as well as transfer that into your smartphone. So I wanted to kind of share with you the video. We put a lot of energy into our days. What if we could get some of that energy back? Ampi is a wearable device that captures the energy from your motion throughout the day and turns it into power for your phone. Your movement is your power. And, and that's about it. That's, that's all there is to it. Wait, cut. That's it? Yeah, you, you move and you plug. This is supposed to be a three minute video. You're killing me. Tages Mike and I met during our engineering PhDs at Northwestern. We all had the same problem. Our phones would die before the end of the day. So many people have this problem. Over the past year and a half, we've refined the technology inside AP. We've optimized the power generation components to the point where you can still produce significant power while maintaining a small form factor. You don't need to be an athlete. Any motion will charge it. We knew we were onto something when AMP kept winning crowd favorite prizes at business competitions. Everyone kept asking if they could get one. People love the idea of taking control over their charging habits. It frees them from the wall and motivates them to get moving. Ampi is designed to just fit into your life. Its shape matches the curves of your body, and it's easy to slip into your pocket or pop into your purse. If you live in a city, you probably walk enough to extend your phone's battery life by three hours. If you also go on a run or maybe go cycling, you can extend it by six hours. The more you move, the more power you get. Or you can use Ampi to charge your wearable devices, or any other device that charges via USB. But you don't need to use the power right away. You can store it for however long you want, and use it when your devices need it most. Now we know that everyone's different, and 
and some people move in some pretty creative ways. So we've designed an accessory kit that lets you move just about any way you want. We can't wait to hear how you use Ampy. If you want to know how much power you're getting out, you can check the companion smartphone app. It lets you track the energy you've generated along with the calories you've burned. With Ampy, you're producing green energy. We've got fully functional prototypes being tested by our pilot customers, and they love them. We're continuously collecting feedback and making improvements, but now we need your support for the final step to move Ampy towards full-scale manufacturing. We're so excited about what's to come. One day, our technology can be integrated directly into smartwatches, fitness trackers, and other crazy wearables that haven't been invented yet. So you never have to plan a bit. But it all starts now. So join us and help us bring Ampy to the world. Is that better? These are three engineers. Normally what we tell them is cross-functional teams are more productive and they're more uh, efficient and they give you a more holistic solution, right? And they went ahead and proved this wrong in all those dimensions, right? The three PhD engineers can actually, if they put their mind to it, right, and just focus on, on one problem. When they first pitched this idea, it was called heel strike. And it was all gonna be based on in your shoes having like piezoelectric technology in the, the heel of your shoe. And they decided, well, that, you know, through various testing and interaction with users, that wasn't going to work. But this did work. And what changed in 18 months is the form factor, the actual physical design, and then making it manufacturable. So what they didn't tell you in the video is they've got um, plastic enclosures coming from a tool that they won. Normally, you'd have to spend like close to six figures on a tool like this, injection molded tool. They got it for free from a competition that actually awarded the tool as part of the competition. So um, this is the value prop right here. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. They actually take, take the lessons from the class and apply it. Um, I don't know if they think this is going to make them rich. There's a lot of ways they could have looked at this technology as maybe part of a vehicle, an electric vehicle, maybe using vibration from shock absorbers to um, you know possibly putting it in smaller devices like a watch, right? In fact, they're talking to watch people, they're talking to uh, the Motorola's of the world. So, questions about that? So if you think about projects and why they fail, this is kind of a, a listing of why projects typically fail. And this is more on the execution side for the most part in terms of, we all know about changing scope and lack of management commitment and conflict between users. There was huge conflict on the HP touchpad between the hardware and software teams. They were almost ready to kill each other, different buildings, right? And yet, the product itself, nobody says that it's no good, right? Nobody says that it's inadequate in any way, except for the fact that there's no ecosystem behind it, right? The founder, we have you know, founders of each of these businesses, and it's a question of you know, what, what is their role? Develop consistent funding, right, so that the, they're never running out of money, per se, that there's always this continual flow of money. Ampy, which used to be my power, uh, spent a lot of time and energy to make sure there was a consistent flow of cash coming in. Most of it not from investors. Most of it coming from competitions, like they said. I can think of three competitions that probably netted them over $200,000, right? Um, maintaining and holding fast the founder's vision for the product, right? You're going to be bombarded as a founder with all sorts of alternative visions and implementations and distractions and you know, fragmentation. What if we did 16 different flavors, right? Don't drown in opportunity. Beecher. Mark, Mark Cuban said Mark Cuban Beecher said. Creek. Beecher Creek, right? But just the idea that there's so many other things you could be doing shouldn't distract you from your fundamental mission or vision, which is to do this and to do this exceptionally well. So you could say, well, there's other Ampy-like devices out there. I encourage you to check them out, right? They're militarized, ruggedized for camping. They're very expensive, they're much larger. They're form factors that you would not want to carry on a day-to-day -day basis, unless you were a camper, right? Um, and then staffing, making sure that the best people are on board, the best people are investing, the best people are working with you and advising you. These are the books that we tend to be using these days. Uh, Steve Blank, Bob Dorf, Eric Reese, 
this whole idea of lean startup methodology has become an ecosystem from Stanford moving its way across the country. So why take this lean approach? Lean presupposes that you can't collect all the requirements up front. Uh, some requirements are derived from actually using the product. Apple has learned this extremely well, right? So yes, they can put a camera on your phone, right? But to actually change the app so that when you finish taking that photograph, it gives you the option of storing it locally or sending it by email or sending it as a text, that took interaction with users. That took careful observation of how people actually want to use the camera and why they're using it and what's their next logical step, right? And then Dropbox comes in and says, well, we know what you want to do. You want to store this in the cloud, right? So you click this box and forevermore, every photograph you take will be stored in the cloud, which more than doubles the value of Dropbox with just that one feature, right? So now my Dropbox account, I don't know about yours, right, is overflowing with photographs that I'm you know, not wanting to delete, right? And at the same time, I'm paying $10 a month for the storage. So I'm in this cognitive dissonance. I could delete them, but those are my family photos. Those are photos I cherish, right? I'd just have to put them somewhere else. There is no free lunch, right? So $10 to Dropbox, right? Um, a traditional business plan is based on a snapshot in time. It's kind of like the problem with uh, you know, Iridium, right? They failed to update it and make it a living, breathing document. They failed to understand the very dynamics we talked about. The declining revenues for celestial, the growing for terrestrial, and the fact that $5 a minute wasn't tenable. There was almost nobody wanting to pay that. Um, emphasis needs to be on creating a fast moving but continual learning process. So how quickly you can iterate, if you can use rapid prototyping techniques, if you can put A-B tests out there. The uh, app world makes it quite uh, easy to do that. Testable hypotheses, right? Um, what assumptions are driving your new business model? So understanding those assumptions and creating simple tests that you can iterate through and validate. How can you test these assumptions in the workplace and actually try to put real dollars behind this if you can? So it's not just a cerebral exercise, but will people actually send money on the option you, you want? Right? Base the decisions on the behavior of your market and not just the words they give you. They'll be glad to tell you what you want to hear, um, but they're not going to always act the way you want them to act. So try to get the, uh, the actions. I think Zynga does a great job. This is from my old you know, WMS days, right? So this is social gaming. This was kind of a, um, a blue ocean at the time. They first came out and had a whole lot of competitors. Their products, I guess, by any kind of game design standard, were a little bit immature, right? They were half-baked, so to speak but they had a lot of trap doors built into their game. So you click on certain features and aspects and they didn't actually work, right? They didn't have time to code them out. But at the same time, they actually put counters on those things so they could figure out, ah, people are clicking on this attribute, a window, a door, a, a, a game element, right? So they, that would help prioritize their, their coding efforts, right? So they put a half-baked product out there, knowing that it's blue ocean, there's not a lot of competition, knowing that the threshold for social gaming was actually pretty low. I mean, people didn't know what it was supposed to be because there wasn't a lot of precedent. Um, and in that sense, they could take a, a limited resource called software development and focus it on where people want to go as opposed to focusing them on everything, right? So that's a lean approach. I call that customer-directed development. This idea of minimum viable product, right? So just building out those features that allow the product to be deployed and no more. That's in essence what Zynga was doing. Um, try to avoid building products that customers don't want, right? So focus on the features they do want. At Motorola, when I was here, especially in the handset business, we didn't really know what customers wanted. We know what the carriers told us, and we took copious notes. But if you added on what carrier A and B and C and D told you, right, you create a list of features that really didn't fit into the memory space, right? <laughs> so it was a bit of a shotgun approach to say, well, let's just do as many as we can, whatever time permits, right? And then just get it out there, right? As opposed to a more scientific approach of saying, well, this is exactly what people want, right? And some carriers wanted certain functionality disabled. Yeah, because it actually hurt because another part of the business. Because they their walled garden. Exactly. I don't and, know who that <laughs> and the funny part is, you know, we were always looking for the killer app. Mm -hmm. And what Motorola missed and Apple got was the killer app isn't really the app 
per se, it's the app store. And this idea that you let people kind of pick and choose what apps they want and create this open ecosystem where anyone can contribute. You create the rules and architecture to enable that and then the testing and the revenue stream behind it. And I think that's the innovation that Apple brought besides an elegant product. There were lots of things. Sony had elegant products, right? Uh, it was the ecosystem that surrounded it. So we're coming from this waterfall approach where basically we try to do things in sequence and you know, frankly, I show waterfall and I'm not really sure we ever really did this. You can rewind even to the 60s and we always had some sort of iterative approach. It was never purely waterfall, but maybe it's a good straw man, right? Here's the agile approach where the problem itself is known. You have a product owner, you have an in-house customer, and you're iterating on the right-hand side to develop software in an agile way. Lean startup is where you have two unknowns, right? The left-hand side and the right-hand side. So you're trying to iterate in terms of what are the real requirements, what is the real business opportunity here, and at the same time, how to best write it into the code. So that's really the idea of customer development, right? You start with the founder's vision, a hypothesis, a problem, and then, of course, a solution. Um, I think it was clear what Ampy's problem was, right? You run out of juice at the end of the day. The irony is you're too busy running around to actually plug in. So why not turn the problem into a solution? If running around can generate the electricity, especially as a businessman running through an airport, which I can relate to so many times. Have you noticed they're taking the outlets out at the airport? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's they're fewer and fewer of them. And they're changing the plug format. Yeah, it's what's up with that? And then they create these little stations, these charging stations, like one every other terminal, right? So, <laughs> so like a 10,000 feet away, there's another charging station. Which is kind of strange, because building probably requires an outlet within 12 feet. But I don't um, see that anymore. I mean, I'm looking at these walls, because yeah. I'm searching for that outlet. I don't know how they're getting around building code that way. <laughs> and having people squat on the floor to plug in their device and keep working, that's kind of embarrassing, right? So customer development is about getting out of the building, getting the students, which is actually the hardest part with students, is to get out of the classroom and say, the answers aren't here. The answers are out there. Don't, don't think you're going to sit here and postulate some you know, wonderful solution, because we're going to challenge you to go out and, you know, who did you talk to? Who did you show this to? Are they willing to spend money on it? Is this your target market? Right? So get out of the building, collect your data. Um, it should include the who you will meet, as well as what data you need to collect. Right? So, Henry Ford did a lot more than just make a, a, a commercialized car or a high volume car. He actually brought automobiles to the masses. And this was his, that was his model, that was his vision to do that. What we don't maybe understand today is at the time the patent for the automobile was held by an organization called uh, ALM, the American Association of Licensed Automobile Manufacturers, A-L-A-M. And at the time, Alan's, Alan's approach was, oh, you want to build cars? Here, you have a license to build a 1,000, right? You pay us that fee, right? And then we'll go to the next guy, and we'll give him a license for a 1,000, and then you'll have a license for a 1,000. So that forced the automobile to become kind of a rich man's toy because you're all doing such small volume at such high costs, especially with the licensing fee, that it couldn't be done any other way. Henry Ford challenged that in court. He actually took a court case against Alan, and for some Unknown reason, he won the court case. Well, there was the Selden patent that may have been part of that. What's that? Selden patent. Yep. The other thing with the assembly line, he learned that from a totally different industry, the meatpacking industry. Right. So in a sense, he brought ideas from other industries together, but he also had the, the wisdom plus the courage to go after the established hierarchy to say, you know what, Alan, you should not have a monopoly right. on the production of automobiles. As long as you do, it'll be nothing more than a rich man's toy, right? And it's not long. It was about the same time as the Standard Oil Trust was broken up. So right. the court may have been quite amenable to his arguments. And the government was kind of swinging towards more populism, I guess, as opposed well, to they were breaking of, up the trust. Right. Kind of going anti-corporate. Right? <coughs> so things were in his favor. It also helped that he had some good publicity behind him. He had won a race that he had never actually been able to run before. So. He wins this very visible race. His name is in the papers. He's going after Alan. He's a hero in many ways, right? Thomas Edison, right? Holder of a thousand patents and he had all these great inventions. And at the same time, um, 
his technology for electricity wasn't what was standardized on, right? It had turned out to be uh, you know, AC as opposed to DC. But at the same time, he had an ecosystem there with Menlo Park for creating and innovating on technologies, right? And to a large extent, it was his methodology was kind of trial and error. But there was some degree of lean startup approach built in in terms of iterating to completion, right? So lean startup in many ways isn't that new. But not Kashla with Sun, right? Um, the funny thing is Sun innovated on something called the um, N-tier architecture or kind of the thin client approach. And in the day, it kind of failed, right? I mean, Java came out of that, but not much else. So this great architecture from Sun never really was commercialized until maybe the last three or four years, right? So we see these very thin client tablets, thin client uh, laptops, um, you know, Samsung, Google, you know, books. Um, and that kind of is in the Vinod Kashla mentality, but it took 20 years to really become mainstream. Elon is amazing, right? He's a serial entrepreneur, founder of PayPal, SpaceX, Tesla, Sol Solar City. We've talked about most, most of these. His fundamental approach is to kind of boil things down to first principles, right? So what is it about battery electric vehicles that makes them preferable over, say, you know, internal combustion, right? He looks at it and he says, well, the power plants are somewhere between 80 or 90% efficient at the plant. And even with distribution losses, you can contrast that with internal combustion, right, in a vehicle that's somewhere between 15 and 18% efficient. So if you look at the efficiencies of converting fuel into energy, usable energy, right, the BEV beats the you know, internal combustion engine, right? His background is physics. He's looking at it as a physics problem, right? And that's how he justifies the BEV. I think it makes sense. Um, he's also the guy that's commercializing space for us with SpaceX. He's also, as I said, with Solar City and one of the founders of the original PayPal. So he's been using his PayPal proceeds to fund all the others. The difference with, with the line is he's doing these three, SpaceX, Tesla, and Solar City, in parallel. So some would say he's insane. It might be. It's close to it. So there's a progression of definitions of entrepreneurship that I share in my classes, right? Obviously, an entrepreneur is someone who commercializes his or her innovation. Drucker searches for change, responds to it, and exploits opportunities. Innovation is a tool of the entrepreneur. So we talk about small business as if it was entrepreneurship, but in many ways, small business isn't innovating. The local dry cleaners is just trying to get your laundry done, pretty much the same way as a thousand other dry cleaners are, right? It's only if they provide something unique and innovative, maybe a drive through service, maybe a green dry cleaning, you know, maybe a uh, some sort of delivery, you know, you name it, right? That's where the innovation and entrepreneurship comes in, right? And it's funny, too, because in society, we seem to be holding up entrepreneurship as some sort of salvation for the jobs, right? We gotta get jobs. We can't seem to get them from Washington. We can't seem to get them from corporate America. Maybe all these entrepreneurs are gonna create jobs, right? I think there's a huge fallacy built into that, right? And here's the fallacy. These small entrepreneurial startups, by definition, if they're going to succeed, have to be more efficient than what they're supplanting, which means they're going to use labor more efficiently for the most part. I'm generalizing, but most of them will have more dollars of revenue per person employed than the companies they supplant, right? So creative destruction says that these new startups are going to get rid of the old dinosaurs, right? Which means the more... <laughs> The more we create these startups, in theory, we're going to get more and more efficient over time with how we use resources and labor. And this job boom that everyone's looking for may not actually happen. Right? If you look at companies like Groupon, Amazon, eBay, Google, their revenue per employee is much higher than the companies they supplanted. Right? And of course, Sean Peter, right? Economic change revolves around innovation. So while I just gave you an argument that says maybe entrepreneurship isn't so good for jobs, right? If you want the economy to grow, this is the necessary fuel. Innovation is absolutely necessary. And Drucker basically says the business must be managed to perceive in the new an opportunity rather than a threat. And I'm aware that I'm probably talking to a lot of you know, corporate employees and 
for corporations look at innovation as possibly a threat, right? And that's the innovator's dilemma. If you're not willing to obsolete yourself, you are by default asking somebody else to obsolete you. So take your pick. Those are your choices, right? All right, I've got a lot more slides, but I fear that I'm running out of time, so I'll just open it up for questions at this point. Questions or comments? I probably didn't go through as many slides. I mean, there's e easily another 30, 40 slides, but we don't have that kind of time, right? Got Three more minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Well, I was going to finish at 10 too, right? Oh. Is that right? Um, we're about five two. Is that we can five two. OK, great. Um, so Drucker basically says, are you hungry for new things? Are you greedy for new things, right? You have to be willing to pursue this, right? So in your companies, are you greedy for new things? Do you practice systematic abandonment? At one point at Motorola, in this building, I was in charge of product cancellation, right? We had so many old <laughs> products that were literally just being dragged around and nobody ever sold, and yet nobody ever canceled. So I was in charge of canceling, and I thought, this is going to be the easiest project I ever worked on. It turned out to be the hardest project I ever worked on because everyone said, wait a minute, you can't cancel that. I said, well, you haven't sold any in three years. Right? Oh, but I got a customer. Ooh, you never know. Right? Well, I was at one company that kind of did that with their inventory. They looked at what was selling, and they simply scrapped out what they weren't going to sell in two or three years right. because it was cheaper to do that than to expand the warehouse. Right. And they also looked for opportunities to get rid of things in the warehouse, like printed documentation they could print on the bags. Sure. One of the projects I had a finger into, and that got rid of 70 plus warehouse spaces. But the other thing is, when they would buy another company, they would apply the ITWA 8020 rule. Sure. They would go through and set up to manufacture the 20% of the products that brought in 80% of the business and just let the rest go away yeah. and meet, let them become special orders. And invariably, nothing was ever ordered out of that. Well, for me, I didn't make any progress on this project at Motorola until I could quantify the cost of a SKU. <laughs> so how much does it cost to carry a SKU year over year over year? Oh. And if it's 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, whatever it is for that SKU, multiply it by all the dormant SKUs, and that's your opportunity. Yeah. Right. Well, my first job was uh, at Belton, and they were sitting on around uh, half to three-quarter million of static to very slow-moving inventory. And their finance rule of thumb was after five years, you paid for it again. And if it sat for five years and nothing was done with it, it was time for it to be moved into another product or sold or scrapped or right. something. Right. Open innovation is the, is the next thing that I think corporations tend to struggle with, right? Mm -hmm. On campus, we tend to open innovate. And what I mean by open innovate is the use of open source products, designs. Um, companies like Local Motors, for example. Have you guys heard of Local Motors? This is an automobile company that makes cars to your specification, right? They're a low volume store. In essence, not really a GM, it's more like a, a customized GM, a, a GM for makers, right? It's the maker version of GM. So you go on their website, and for $50,000, they'll build a car for you that you specified in terms of steering wheel, suspension, engine, transmission, everything, even the appliques, they don't like to paint their cars. They use this kind of film that mm -hmm. helps you customize your car, right? They never will build more than 2,000 of any design, right? And what's nice about it is everything's open source. So if your suspension element breaks, right, you could just buy one, I suppose, at a store, or you can print one on your 3D printer without violating any IP, because all of it is open source, right? So Local Motors is actually trying to do this kind of open innovation. The other example is Threadless. Have you guys heard of Threadless? T-shirt company based in Chicago. So artists, local artists, submit their designs. It goes through this kind of funnel-like process which says, all right, vote on the design you like. The one that has the most votes, we're going to go to print. And again, we're only going to print a few thousand, right? So we keep the exclusivity and the prices can stay high. Uh, the artists themselves are part of a community. It's kind of a prosumer model, producers and consumers kind of working together. Um, so the people who buy it and the people who design it are often sometimes the same people, right? It's the same population. So Threadless is all about uniquely designed t-shirts, right? You're not gonna see this at the Gap, 
You're not gonna see this at Target or Walmart or Costco, darn, because I do all my shopping at Costco, right? Um, but they make their money on the community. It's more about the community than it is about high volume. So that is open innovation. New value from existing, right? Destroying the old order and creating something new. Uh, creating value from existing things and processes, not just new things, but they have to have new value. Different types of innovation, technical, social, and economic. Um, I'm gonna kind of just go jump through here, some types of innovation. FedEx, right? FedEx versus USPS. USPS was always about low cost delivery, least cost routing. They hired IEs to figure out the actual least cost to get from point A to point B. Independent of time, it was always about cost, right? FedEx says, well, what if we just flip that? It says, well, if it's about time and not about cost, what would happen, right? Over, over time, right, their costs would come down, even though initially the fastest route might be the most expensive. If you get enough people aggregating there, the fastest route could also become the cheapest, right? So they actually designed a whole network for delivering overnight. They chopped up the clock so that they could literally deliver overnight. Technology innovation. This is actually one laptop per child. You guys remember this? OLPC. The idea was to have a sub, what was it, sub $200 laptop? Or was it sub $100? Sub $100. $100, right? Sub $100. Great idea. And they actually did make it work and they brought it to market only to find that the social adoption wasn't there. People didn't know what to do with it, right? There was no way to really charge it up. There was no lesson plans in the classrooms. The students would bring it home and they, the laptops would never come back to class because somebody at home has cannibalized it, sold it, or acquired it for their own use. So when the adults and the kids are, and the teachers are not all on the same page, right? Even great technology can go to waste. Process innovation. I teach a course in globalization. The, 40-foot container has revolutionized the world, right? Made transcontinental, you know, global shipping not only viable but cost-effective and now ubiquitous. So everything now, multimodal transportation, that same 40-foot container goes on rail, goes on truck, goes on, on ship, right? It's only 51 years old. Yeah, it's not that old. Standardization was 1963. So imagine pre-1963 what the, the, you know, the hull of a ship looked like before containers, right? It must have been chaos, and it must have been very labor intensive to move. They had to hoist stuff out unless they had, a, had it set up with ramps where they could get a truck or a trolley down in there to pull it out. It's quite a mess, right? Yeah, so the container kind of revolutionized the world. This will be my last slide because I know I'm out of time. Um, Tesla, right? Vertical integration. So they build their cars from raw aluminum. So on one end comes raw aluminum sheets, and on the other end, Tesla Model S's are being driven off, right? They sell their cars directly online, right? So Fisker did not do this. Fisker used the dealership model, which was very difficult to overcome kind of that inertial, that initial kind of startup problem. Um, they're building out a nationwide network of car charging because they know people are hesitant to buy a car they can't refuel on a long drive. So if you can get nationwide, coast to coast networking and charging. They also were bringing in battery swap, which wasn't really their invention. I'm pretty sure they got that from uh, other startups. And then, of course, they licensed their battery technology to Mercedes and Toyota. So they're actually kind of a innovation hub of sorts. It's not just cool cars that are real expensive and electric. We've seen that before, right? What we haven't seen is this bundle of innovation. And yes, even, you know, Elon Musk is in court in the upper right in probably 10 different states. Right? Constantly. Constantly important. So he's t following the Ford model of, I'm going to fight stupidity where, you know, where I can fight him, which is in the courts. So states like Texas that say, you cannot sell online because we require you to sell cars through a dealership model, right? He's going to say, oh yeah, I'll see you in court, right? Well, even Ford, when he first sold cars, they shipped them out. And then it's gradually established Ford agencies. Mm -hmm. Ford originally, what Tesla was trying to do, Ford did originally. <laughs> it's funny how what, and everyone thinks the battery electric car is something new to the last, say, 20 years. Detroit Electric, about 1908, 1908 right? Yeah. 1910. So back in the 1910 era, electric cars were marketed to women, right? Why is that? Well, 
because the gasoline cars required you to turn you a crank. Starters. So it was very oily and dirty and messy and right. And so these delicate, you know, women in their outfits, right? They're not going to be turning oily, greasy cranks. But an electric car, you, you, in essence, push the button or turn the switch, right? They kind of look like big phone booths on wheels. Yeah, yeah. But they actually had a market. There was a market for electric cars. And they were basic. And at that time, cars were basically city cars. Yep. And short distances weren't an issue because the interstate highway didn't really exist. There were so few paved roads at that point. Mm -hmm. But who cares if you go 10 or 20 miles? It's about it anyways, right? Yeah, because the Pavian roads didn't really get started, started in earnest until the end of the teens right. and really took off in the 20s. Any other questions or comments? Mark, thank you. All right, thank you.